Have you wrestled with imposter syndrome? Excessive and unsubstantiated self-doubt coupled with an uncanny lack of confidence? I'm your host, Betty Danowitz. Listen as I interview highly successful individuals about their experience with this imposter syndrome and how it manifests itself in their lives in this If You Ask Betty podcast series dealing with imposter syndrome. Hi, Bo. Hey. Thanks for being on the podcast. Hey, Betty. How are you doing? Doing well, doing well. So, Bo, tell us about you. Well, I am, uh, I've been in the uh, sales industry for 30 years this month. Um, so I've, I've been doing this quite a while. Uh, started developing training for adult learners back in 98. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because where I really felt my imposter syndrome was in that role. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure, later. But, um, you know, beyond, beyond what I do for a living, I mean, I'm a father to seven, grandfather to three. And, uh, you know, just enjoy passing on what I can to help others. It's, you know, makes me feel good when I can, you know, give others the lessons that I've learned and uh, maybe shortcut some of the time they need to, to get up to speed. Yeah. What would you say are some of your biggest accomplishments in life or in work or both? Uh, you know, I would say in life, I mean, I'm. I've been very blessed uh, to have just a, an amazing family. Uh, I've got a wife of uh, 33 years this year. We've got seven kids. Um, we've been, you know, very fortunate to be able to uh, adopt children. Uh, so we have three adopted kids. So I would say that overall, the uh, my biggest accomplishment in life is just, you know, having a family and making an impact because all my kids now, I mean, they're anywhere from 18 to 31. They're all uh, well-adjusted adults uh, who are, are doing well. So that's probably my biggest accomplishment. That's something to be proud of for sure. What would others say about you? So if I ask them, <laughs> tell me about Bo's biggest accomplishments, what would they say? I'm pretty quick with an 80s reference, uh, a movie line, or a dad joke. I think that's pretty much what I'm known for. Uh, and, uh, I always tend to have a cup of coffee with me. Um, you know, the other day, I mean, I, you know, it's interesting. I talk about, um, one of the things that gets me the most fulfillment is, is just helping others. Um, you know, and I was having a conversation with someone that used to be on my team and, uh, you know, he was just, he was saying that, you know, Hey, you know, the biggest thing you do is you make others better. Um, you know, and I've had a lot of people who, uh, have poured into me. Uh, to to help me get to where I am. And so I like to, you know, do the same for others. So I think that probably what people would, would tend to say about me. Yeah. Yeah. Your um, 80s reference, movie, movie quote, dad joke, cup of coffee, like we could be twins. Mm -hmm. I am I am the best at dad jokes and I'm not a dad, but I'm good at them. Yeah, and the good I practice. The good thing is my my kids are good at them too, so that makes me happy. <laughs> so it's just it's just a ball of laughs whenever you guys are together. I'm sure. Yeah, it's a ball of something. But yeah. <laughs> so, what has been your experience with imposter syndrome? Uh, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, you know, my wife and I met when we were 19. We you know, we met and 13 days later picked out our wedding date. And that was it. I mean, once I met my wife, I just wanted to get married. Um, so we got married when we were 20, just over a year after we got married, we had our first kid. And, you know, and it's interesting. I went into sales because I didn't need a degree. I didn't have a college degree, didn't need a degree to go do that. And I needed to, to earn money. Um, so I was in sales for probably about 16 years. And I got, uh, like most trainers, I got promoted into a training role uh, because they said, all right, he's good at explaining this. Let's just make him a trainer. So I became an accidental trainer. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I always felt like I did a good job of training. I mean, I, we got good reviews. People love the training. Um, but when it came to imposter syndrome, uh, one of my mentors, a lady named Lauren Choate, who, you know, was in charge of human resources when at a company I was at. Um, and she, she just understood how people learned and, 
I was in her office one night and we were talking about training and it's just one of those conversations. It's like five 30, you're sitting around after work and I'm just picking her brain on stuff. And she talked about the concept of chunking learning material. And that was the moment that my imposter syndrome came out and for the, really the first time, because I had been the director of training for North America for 10 years, felt like I did a good job and I didn't know what chunking was. And I was, I was terrified to ask. Um, and I remember vividly leaving her office that night and saying, okay, whatever chunking is, I can never ask someone about this because I don't want them to know that I have no clue. And so, you know, I spent a lot of years um, just kind of worried that someone was going to find out like, Hey, you're really not qualified to be doing what you're doing. And, you know, so that was how I got in touch with imposter syndrome and, and where I really first felt it. And it is absolutely a real thing. You still experience that sometimes? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, the, the interesting thing about imposter syndrome is, you know, that was, I don't know, probably 2014, 2015, when that conversation occurred. And I went and took my first class on adult learning in 2017. And, you know, I remember, you know, coming away from that class thinking, geez, you know, I really, you know, there's, there's all these people who know a whole lot about this subject and, and I need to go learn that. And so, you know, it got to a point where I was considering the uh, ATD CPTD uh, credential mm -hmm. uh, course, but I had an opportunity to go to college. And since I didn't have a college degree, I thought, okay, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go to college and learn this. The, the interesting thing is, it was the fear of dealing with the imposter syndrome that drove me at 48 as a, as a, you know, full-time working dad who, who traveled a ton and, you know, spent all this time away from my, my family to go work full-time in college as well. Um, and, what was interesting was, as I was pursuing that degree, um, I kind of knew as much as most of the professors. Um, mm. And so that was an interesting aspect to the, you know, to the imposter syndrome is here I was feeling like an imposter that I needed a degree. And certainly I learned things throughout the, my four years in college. But I would tell you, I, I already knew a lot more than I thought I did. Um, you mm -hmm. know, and some of it was like, you know, stuff that, you know, you just do naturally just because you know it's the right thing to do. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, there's a, sure. there's a reason behind that. But, um, yeah. you know, I think when it, in terms of how it manifests itself and what I, what I struggled with the most um, and what I still struggle with is you know, I, I spent four years going through college and, you know, I realized that I'm not an imposter. Uh, I know I know what I'm doing when it comes to training. But, you know, still, even after all of that, you know, there becomes this, well, do I really know enough if I don't have the next degree? And, you know, mm. so I, I think. So do you. Sorry. Go ahead. Do you think that the degree helped or did it make it worse? Did it make no different? Like what, how do you think that helped or didn't with your imposter syndrome? You know, honestly, I think for me, it helps a little bit um, because, you know, at least I've got the piece of paper in terms of what I can do. I don't think it helped. Um, you mm. know, again, there's certain things that I picked up that, I didn't know going in, but in terms of things that, you know, play out every day and how training is designed and things that I would do, I, I don't know that it mm -hmm. really helped. And, and honestly, I don't, I don't know if it made it worse or better. I think 
Um, on one hand, you know, I've got a degree, but now you're preparing yourself. You know, you go from preparing yourself to people who don't have a degree to, okay, people now have master degrees. And so I think if right. I ended up going after a master's degree, it'd be, okay, well, what about the people who have doctorates? Right. So you're just, you're just leveling up in your comparison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Still sort of maintaining the same level or maybe improving your self-doubt a little bit, but then for a little bit for a moment, and then the next comparison comes up and that kind of triggers everything again. So when, when this is happening, when you're having sort of, we, I, a lot of times I call it an episode of imposter syndrome, how does it manifest itself? You, you mentioned this a little bit before, but for some people, it's like perfectionism or overachieving or self-sabotage. What is it that you experience? What is the change in behavior that you experience when you start to feel this imposter syndrome? Overachieving, 100%. Um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I have high standards for myself regardless. You know, so I, I like to work hard, but I think the imposter syndrome really drives me to to go above and beyond, you know, what, you know, may be required. Um, so I would say overachieving hundred percent. And, you know, and along with that, I would kind of say perfectionism, um, you know, as part of the overachieving, but yeah, I don't, I don't know that I suffer sure. from like the self-sabotage. Like I don't, you know, find myself. And that's fair. Yeah. yeah. I don't find myself saying, okay, well, you're not, you're not good enough. You're not, you're not worthy enough. I think, you know, for me, the imposter syndrome just drives me to work harder um, and always yeah. be like the hardest working person in the room. Always, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that. And that, that kind of quiets that. If you're the hard, if you look around and you know, you're the hardest working person in the room and you've produced the most or the best or both. Does that kind of quiet that voice that's like, telling you you're not good enough and they're going to figure you out? You know, I think, I think it, I don't know that it quiets it as much as it maybe puts it at arm's length for a little bit. I think it's always there. Mm. I think, you know, people that suffer from imposter syndrome likely are always going to suffer from imposter syndrome. Like I said, no matter, no matter what you feel like you need to achieve to make sure that, okay, I don't feel like an imposter. There's always going to be something more mm -hmm. out there. Um, you know, that's like, okay, how can I validate myself? Um, yeah. So that's interesting. You say validate yourself. So, you know, uh, when we think about the way that imposter syndrome manifests itself in your life, so you said overachieving and perfectionism, do you think there are other contributing factors to that? So We've talked in previous episodes about how some common triggers for people are like when they are new to a job or when there's a, um, a sudden change in expectations, things like that, that can kind of be common triggers. But what I'm wondering is, do you think there's anything else about you, about your life experiences that contributes to your imposter syndrome? Anything you're willing to oh, share? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think 100%. Um coming into the workforce at 20 with, you know, a mm -hmm. wife and mm -hmm. a kid shortly after and knowing that I don't have a college degree. I don't have any skills. I really just need to hustle and grind. Um, you know, and that's, that was how, you know, I, I made a living, um, you know, cause I started yeah. in, in sales and, you know, that's all hustle and grind. Um, you know, so I think, I think part of it is just an ingrained, you know, I've always felt like I have to outwork everybody. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, you get into a role that you really love and it's like, oh my gosh, if they find out that I don't have a clue, um, you know, am I going to lose everything I've worked for? Yeah. Yeah. Some folks too feel that like things that have happened to them in the past, and, and I'm not trying to probe into your past. I'm just asked. I just want to put it out there. You know, you talked about getting started so early. I mean, I can relate to that. I got married when I was 20. I usually follow that statement with the saying, I don't recommend it. 
<laughs> was definitely yeah. young. Um, but, you know, but, um, but also I've been working since I was 14. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've always felt like I, I like to work. Sometimes I think people have a hard time understanding that because I'm often considered an overachiever or I, I work too much. I'm a workaholic. I'm a, a super person, all of these things. But I actually really yeah. like it. Um, I actually like to do things and get things done. And so I just wondered, is there anything else like growing up that you think may have contributed uh, to, to what it is that gives you sort of this, this feeling of self-doubt, even though you have more than enough proof that you are fully capable and successful, you still have that feeling. So anything else that you think might have contributed to that? You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, you know, growing up, uh, I, you know, I was never part of the in crowd in school. Um, you know, it's funny. My wife and I went to the same high school together and we had totally different sets of friends. We never met. We graduated same day and never met because we had these wow. just totally opposite sets of friends. Um, knew a lot of the same people, but like, I just, I didn't run in that crowd. And I think, you know, obviously, you know, if you've, if you've watched any 80 movies, there's, there's always people that want to, you, you want to be in that crowd. Right. Um, you know, right. Uh, yeah. and I think there was, there's probably always, uh, probably a little bit of that too, just, you know, growing up, like, okay, I'm, I'm not there. I want to, I want to be there. Um, you know, how can I, how can I get there? How can I, you know, achieve things? Um, you know, and then, you know, coming out of high school, you know, just, I did a, a year of college and then, you know, pretty much straight into the workforce. Um, you know, you, back then I, I felt kind of, I don't know, invalidated, uh, or just not valued because I didn't have a degree. I think, um, you know, I looked around at peers that, mm -hmm. you know, kind of came out of high school, went to college, got their degree, went into a job. And, uh, you know, here I was, you know, struggling through sales and having kids and that sort of thing. I mean, so I think it was, I think yeah. it was rough. I think it was always a, a struggle. And I think, you know, when you do that, um, you know, I think you're very cautious to make sure that you don't lose that. I mean, you know, as you, as you climb and climb yeah. and climb, yeah. you're not sliding back down. The degree, it's interesting you bring that up because I think that there are a lot of folks in our generation, we're actually the same generation, mm -hmm. Bo, you and me. And I'm, I mean, we're awfully close. And um, I, I think there's a lot of folks in our generation that have similar feelings about the degree right? Because I, your story is so, so similar to mine. Like I went to, I actually went to three different colleges for three years before I gave up because I was, I just wanted to work and it was too hard to work and go to school and be married at the same time. It was too many mm -hmm. things. I had one had to go. So it was school. So I totally understand. Um, I totally get it. But I felt for a long time that I'm not good enough. They're going to figure it out because I don't have a degree. Yep. And that like somebody somewhere told us that we needed a degree to be valid. I love to use that word valid to be um, to be verified, to be, you know, approved. Yep. Right. We needed that. Well, let me ask you this. If you if your 18 year old came to you and was like, Dad, I'm really good at this job that I'm doing. And I think I'm just going to keep working. I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to go for a degree. What would your advice be to him? And just be honest, it can be shut up. You're going to get your degree. That's totally fine if that's your advice, but I'm just wondering how your perspective may or may not have changed. Well, you know what? I, I would tell you now that out of my seven kids, um, I have one yeah. with a degree and one in college and, you know, we've never encouraged our kids to go to college if they didn't want to. Um, you know, my you know, 23 year old son, almost 24 year old son um, is a Marine um, in a very prestigious program. And he, he, you know, graduated and just was like, I don't want to go to school. I'm like, okay, well go to work. You're paying rent. Um, but, you know, figure out what you want to do, but don't go spend money on a degree. If, mm -hmm. if that isn't what you want to do. If yeah. you don't want it. And, you know, I spent a lot of time in Germany for work. And one of the things that I, I really love about, 
you know, what they do in Germany is, you know, you get to a point in, in high school where you're either going to go to college or you're going to go to a trade. And, you know, in Germany, the trades that they involve, you know, work with someone as an apprentice. And so you actually learn a craft mm -hmm. from the trade. And I, I will tell you, like, you know, my own opinion is we desperately need to encourage kids to to go into the trades um, that, you know, you don't have to have a college degree to to do something worthwhile. And, and honestly, when you start talking about imposter syndrome, I really fear for like this generation right now that's in their 20s that's coming up because, you know, not only are they, they're getting saddled with a lot of debt because people are telling them you've got to go to college and it's expensive, mm -hmm. but they're, I think they're staying in school longer because you don't have to start paying back student loans until you're out of school. And so if you're going to go for a four-year degree, uh, a four-year degree doesn't really help you because you're competing against people with master's. And, you know, by the time you get to a master's, you might yep. as well get a doctorate. And so, you know, you you have these people who come out and, you know, I, I, I would imagine they probably feel like imposters if they don't have all those advanced degrees. And I think it's only going to get worse. I think, you know, they're going to struggle. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And then and then they come out and maybe they have those advanced degrees, but they have no work experience. So they still yeah. can't get a job. Because they've had to spend all their time and rack up all this debt to get it's 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 um, in this country. Higher education is very difficult mm -hmm. to navigate as to whether or not it's a good idea or a bad idea. But I love what you said. We do need folks to go. We do need kids to go into the trades. We do need young adults to go into the trades, largely because like 40 percent of that workforce is retiring in the next mm -hmm. three to five years. And we need to fill those spots because, I mean, if you think it's hard to get a contractor out now, <laughs> think about think about when 40 percent of them are, you know unavailable. Um, yeah, I, I love that. I thank you for saying that. And I think it's interesting how, uh, how, how your opinion has changed based on what used to, for lack of a better word, haunt you about your degree it used to sort of bother you, sit on your shoulder, chip, chirp in your ear saying they're going to find out you're not good enough because you don't have a degree. But now when you're, when it's time for you to pass that information on to the next generation, you're like, Basically, you're like, don't be like me. Do what you want to do, what's, what you're passionate about. And if it's the trades, I'm right behind you. And I think that's I think that's great. I think it's interesting because I think a lot of people listening will completely resonate and, and feel very similarly. Yeah. And you know that. what's interesting is, you know, for, for me, I mean, I got done with my bachelor's degree. And, and my initial thought was, you know, hey, I'm going to go to school and I'm going to go through my bachelor's and get my master's, maybe even look at a doctorate. And by the time I got done with my bachelor's, you know, I, I really looked at everything and thought, OK, the juice is not worth the squeeze for me at this point. And, you know, while I still mm -hmm. sometimes feel like an imposter and you're going to compete against people, because I do think people make hiring decisions based on, you know, what initials you have behind your name or, or what degrees you have, uh, you know, I've learned mm -hmm. that, you know, I'd rather just hire people who are, who are good people, um, you know, and mm -hmm. while it may not help you, you know, get the job you want, um, you know, I'm not sure I really want to work in an environment where it's all about degrees. So agreed. Agreed on the degrees. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I got one more question for you. Why did you want to be a part of this imposter syndrome project? Yeah, because I struggled with this for a long time. And and I, you know, I don't think I'm alone. I mean, it's been it's been interesting and I I feel like the learning and development side of things has a lot of people who struggle with imposter syndrome. And and being part of that community, I mean, because like I said earlier, a lot of people get into that by accident. I mean, they just, I don't know a lot of people that mm -hmm. went to college to get trained to go into learning and development. I think, you know, who's I that? know one. Um, Matt Pearson, he's actually not in 
learning and development. He's, he's in marketing. Though. I like math. So he's like, he is brilliant. But he actually went and got a degree got a degree for that. He's the only person I know, and I know yeah. everybody, Bo. I know all the people. Yeah, he's but the I only mean, one you I think know. about it. Like, how many people do you know who just came into this as just an accident? Like, I'm mm-hmm. here now. Um, mm-hmm. You know, who are like, okay, well, do I know what I need to know? And am I really as good as I think I am? And, you know, for me, it really boiled down to, you know, I've got this sacred trust to go train people and help them with their job. And I want to do it as, as good as possible. And I want to make sure that I'm, I'm doing the best for them. And, you know, I want to squash that imposter syndrome. And if I've got a piece of paper, that'll help me. Um, but I mean, you know, I really wanted to share like, okay, well, what happens when you get to the other side of that chasm? I mean, you know, you're on this side of the chasm with Mm -hmm. imposter syndrome. Well, what happens when you get to the other side? And, you know, I think you look back and you realize the imposter syndrome really wasn't real. Um, You know, that was just me putting the imposter syndrome on myself. Um, And so, I mean, it, it's a real thing. It's a real emotion. I think, you know, we all struggle with it on some level and, you know, I just wanted to, you know, join the podcast and share that, you know, don't, don't get sucked down into it, you know, and, and I know sometimes, you know, people, people can kind of spiral about that and, you know, it can, it can really drive them nuts. But at the end of the day, um, what I've also found is that, you know, people I think that really struggle with imposter syndrome are those that are unwilling to be vulnerable and ask questions. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's one of the things that I I always recommend to people is just, you know, if you don't know, just ask the question, you know, people are always willing to help. And that's one of the things I I really loved about the the L and D community is, you know, if you ask a question and you're, you're, you're sincere, I mean, there are just so many people who are just like, yeah, let me, let me jump in and help you. And, you know, so I want to be one of those Mm -hmm. people and just, let everyone know. Um, once you get to the other side of that chasm, you're going to realize the posture syndrome was nowhere near as important as you thought it was. Well, I think that's great advice and a great reason to be part of it. So thank you so much, Bo Bodo, for sharing your experience with us. Hey, thanks to the listeners, too. I hope you'll continue with this series and hear more stories about dealing with imposter syndrome. There's so many amazing people that deal with this every day and sharing their story helps them and it helps you feel less alone. So be sure to follow If You Ask Betty on LinkedIn and YouTube for more episodes and resources about imposter syndrome. Oh, and tell your friends about it. Hit that share button so that they also know that they're not alone. Peace out.